in every town, regardless of how rigorous the training, as long as your Pokemon still have a heartbeat, there is a building of solace. A sanctuary where they can get all the treatment they need, no matter your upbringing, no matter your current circumstances, and with no questions asked. They heal you back up to full, all for free, with no strings attached. Of course, that only exists in the utopian world of Pokemon. But what if we were to bind this utopia with the shackles that plague our society? Grades, jobs, promotions, food, rent, taxes, water cooler talk, and worst of all, debt. The everyday worries that fill the vacuum of our minds. We're an 11 year old, not very subtly told by our mums that we're no longer welcome at home. And when given the task to complete the Pokedex by a neighbour who's most certainly not exploiting child labour, we return a week later with a champion title. It's obvious we can't hold down a job, so paying for health insurance is clearly off the table. You already know the rules of a hardcore Nuzlocke, so I'll paste them on the screen to read at your own pace. But the main rule we'll be adding to this challenge is that healing in Pokemon centers is completely banned. We absolutely do not want to be in debt. Alongside that, we'll also be banning other free heals like beds, NPCs, and depositing Pokemon NPCs, as that means that we'll just be in debt to someone else. Any Pokemon that gets healed in this manner will be considered dead and no longer usable. And if our entire team gets healed, this won't count as a wipe, but I'll need to start with a fresh new team at the earliest convenience. This won't be relevant in this game, but we also won't be allowed to grow berries. Not because it fits this weird scenario that I've made up, but it would kind of defeat the spirit of this challenge. The rules aren't that bad, right? Pretty easy to follow? Well, let's talk about everything that entails. First, the obvious. We can't freely heal our Pokemon, meaning we have to get into battles extremely sparingly and make sure that we take as little damage as possible. And if our Pokemon get status, then we'll need to have to pay to heal their condition. This means that we'll want to avoid trainers as much as possible where we can. But what this means is that we'll get even less money to pay for healing items. A vicious cycle. This, however, is actually the least of our worries. While annoying, healing items lying around are quite abundant, so it's not the worst, and we can always purchase some if really needed. There is, however, another limiting factor. Power points. We have a limited amount of moves we can use, and unlike healing items, PP restoring items are actually quite limited. Now what does this mean for us? Well, let me answer that question with another. How do Pokemon level up? By defeating other Pokemon and gaining XP. And what does defeating Pokemon cost? Power points. Meaning, we even have to be cautious about training our Pokemon. In a challenge where the amount of damage we deal and the amount of damage we take is more important than ever. And even worse, because of all this, I can't justify my excuse to use rare candies. So for the first time on this channel, I'll actually be grinding my Pokemon. Ew. Can we make it through this cruel world we've created and against all the odds still come out the champion? I don't know, probably. So after being kicked out, we're forced to pick up some odd jobs and Oak's there to save the day. He lets us pick a starter so that we can help him complete a project that he's been working his whole life towards. Sure, Oak, we'll get around to that. When picking my starter, I usually pick the one that would make the game harder. And in this challenge, this choice makes a world of difference. Remember, we have to choose a Pokemon that will be gaining the majority of XP from four strainer battles, and that will most likely be our starter. So naturally, the harder one to use will be Charmander, right? It's weak against the first two gyms, after all. Well, sure it struggles against the first two gyms, but those are only two battles amongst a myriad of others. And there are plenty of solutions to deal with them. They're only the first gems after all. See, there are actually quite a few force battles up until that point. And guess which is the most common type? Bug. The first move that Charmander learns is Ember at level 7. Ember has 25 power points and will very easily one-shot all of the bug Pokemon on the way. Not only that, but Viridian Forest is full of bugs that give out some pretty good early game XP, so we can power level Charmander pretty early on. So onto Squirtle. Well, the first move it learns is Bubble, and that has 30 power points. It will also tear through Brock's team with a very limited cost, so Squirtle's not even a contender. But surely it isn't Bulbasaur. It's a grass Pokemon. It can solo the first two gyms with no issues. True. But like I said, there are only two battles. For some reason, Bulbasaur is the only starter to learn the status move as its first move. Leech Seed. And Leech Seed has a measly 10 power points. And worse yet, 
90% accuracy, meaning on average, we will miss one. But Lee Cheat is basically a one-hit KO move, right? You only have to use it once. Not quite. Yes, you only have to use it once, but then you have to stall for 12 turns. That's 12 turns of wasting PP, but even scarier, risking damage, maybe even crit. And it doesn't even end there. Bulbasaur does in fact get a damaging move soon after at level 10. Vine Whip. And Vine Whip, for whatever reason, also has 10 power points. What were they doing to this poor Pokemon when designing it? Sure, it can solo the first two gyms, but many trainers in between use Bug, Poison, and Flying Pokemon, all of which resist Bulbasaur's stabs, meaning grinding will be incredibly hard and will be risking even more damage. Bulbasaur is also weak against two of our rival's Pokemon, and four later on. Bulbasaur needs some love. You will find that I tend to overexplain my thoughts, but I figured I'd give you a taste as to what sort of stuff we'll need to worry about throughout this entire challenge. Something something Apple, something something Doctors. Figured I'll give my Pokemon a healthy nicknaming scheme in case our food situation becomes a bit too dire. Now while some people consider this rival battle to be the first official battle, I personally don't as I never see a reason to reset this early on. Like, nothing's actually happened yet, you're just wasting time. But in this case, we absolutely want to win as this is the one time you're forced to heal afterwards. And since we have no other Pokemon, this won't count as a death, meaning we won the free XP. This mostly comes down to luck, but you can get better odds by using a Growl on the first turn. On Route 1, I grab Almond the Pidgey, and in the forest, Chia Seed the Caterpie. These encounters are more or less unavoidable, but I'm trying to ignore early encounters as once we deposit them, they get healed, and that means they're lost. Maybe they could be of use later. Not too further up, we have our first forced battle, and let's just jump in and see what happens without any training. We face off against a Weedle, and there is one big benefit to using Apple. He can't be poisoned by his constituents. So we can just keep using tackles as Weedle alternates between String Shot and Poison Sting, without worrying too much. It does get close as Apple had taken some damage beforehand while catching our encounters, but eventually Weedle goes down to a final tackle and gives us enough XP to learn Leech Seed. And why not move straight on to Brock? Not much to lose. I use one of my potions to heal Apple back to full. Brock leads with Geodude and I send out Apple. That 5 level difference is actually kind of scary now that I'm looking at it. Apple manages to move first, landing the Leech Seed, and Geodude sets up a defense curl. And now we can just spam Growls, lowering Geodude's attack so we can just recover back the damage it does to us. We can survive one crit, but that would put us in a rough spot for Onyx. Thankfully Brock doesn't realize that I'm not actually attacking Geodude using far too many defense curls. Eventually, Geodude goes down while Apple is still pretty close to full health. And Apple just misses level 10 when he would have learned Vine Whip. Onyx starts off with Bind as we once again set up a Leech Seed. Bind's kind of annoying as it will do damage every turn, offsetting the health we recover back from Onyx's attacks. But Onyx is a really bad Pokemon. Leech Seed eventually drains it, winning us the first badge. We managed to pull through with minimum battles. It's not exactly free as a couple of crits could have been pretty bad, but resetting now doesn't really cost any time. To make it more consistent for next time, spoiler, we definitely aren't doing this on the first run. I could maybe sacrifice a Metapod to Apple so I can learn Vine Whip after defeating Geodude. But so far, things are looking pretty good. Apple's still got plenty of PP left, and we've still got plenty of healing items. But now, during this stretch to the next gym, we have to fight five Force Trainer battles. Every single trainer resisting Apple's moves. Mom, I got the hint. I'm leaving. First up is Bellcatcher Colton. The first Caterpie and Weedle both go down to a barrage of tackles, but by the time we get to the second Caterpie, our health's starting to look pretty low. I set up a Leech Seed so the tackle from Caterpie can't kill, but I should have done this much sooner. Onwards to our next battle, we actually have a choice. We either fight a Lass with two Pokemon, Rattata and Nidoran, or a Bugcatcher with four Bug Pokemon. I actually go for the Bugcatcher as we need to try and get as much XP as we can early on. And this Bugcatcher is Metapod and Kakuna. Weedle goes down to a few tackles and I set up a Leech Seed on Caterpie. After lowering its attack with Growl, I begin to switch in and out between Apple and Almond. This lets us drain Caterpie's HP while not using any PP, and any damage we take on the switch is healed up by Leech Seed. Almond also gains a level. Next up is Kakuna, and we want all the XP from it to go to Apple. I set up a Leech Seed then use a couple of tackles while Kakuna's defenses are low. Then I can stall out the rest of its health with Growl. We do the exact same for Metapod, and Apple is already at level 14, with us only having fought forced battles. 
into Mount Moon and we really want a Geodude, but we get the much more common Zubat. I love the Zubat line, but for some reason they decided to disable it evolving into a Crobat until you get the national decks. And Golbat itself is kind of mediocre. Well, that's if it can even become a Golbat. Blueberry's moveset is actual trash. I think this will just be a damage sponge more than anything. Mount Moon actually doesn't have any force battles up until the very end, so we can go around picking up some game-changing items without risking any of our Pokemon. The important ones being the TM for Bullet Seed, a Rare Candy, an Aether, and a Star Piece. All without fighting a single trainer. But with that we move on to our next force battle, a Team Rocket Grunt. This Grunt starts off with a Rattata, and with the Stab Hyper Fang, it's terrifying. It even outspeeds the lower Apple's defense with Tail Whip, as Apple hits a Vine Whip. I want to preserve PP, so as Apple outspeeds to use another Tail Whip, I go for a Tackle, not getting the kill. Alright, I need to switch out. Into Blueberry, and god it's so bad. Alright, need to switch back, and Apple takes a Hyper Fang. It looks like I can survive a non-crit one, and I do. A tackle finishes Rotata off. Next time I'm just using two Vine Whips. Zubat's next, and Leech Seed. Zubat has no damage output, so I just keep switching in and out, and we're done with the first grunt. But right after that, we get stopped by this nerd who carries two poison types. He leaves with the Grimer, which gets seeded. After which I start the Growl Spam as I want Apple to evolve before the next gym. After Grimer goes down, Apple grows to level 15 where he learns Poison Powder and Sleep Powder. Both moves are super helpful to us as one does passive damage every turn and the other lets us stall turns without worrying about damage. They also have a good PP count to waste turns. Next up is Coughing, who Apple planted seeds into. Apple got a decent amount of XP from Grimer so I figured I'd use the switch strats for Coughing to preserve PP. Throwing in the sleep powder every now and then. I would have preferred the 6B to go to Almond, but Blueberry is the only one that would have survived Coughing's attacks without worrying about poison. But we can make up for some XP as Voltorb comes out. I've used up all of Apple's lead seeds at this point, so we poison it instead. And as the only attacking move it has is Tackle, we can safely use Almond as our switch partner. And as Voltorb goes down, Apple just misses the level 16 threshold. I thought we had enough. At least Almond gains two levels, learning Gust. And this made me realize something painfully obvious. All this time, we could have been Switch training. But with Almond having learned Gust, we have the perfect opportunity. Climbing up this ladder, we get taken to a Paris floor, where as the name suggests, you mostly run into Paris. Here we can have Apple as our lead and keep switching into Almond to one shot with Gust, gaining some XP. Doing this, we can get the little bit of experience we need to evolve Apple, but we actually keep going until Apple hits level 17. I would have actually kept going, but unfortunately, on the switch, it's quite likely for Almond to be attacked, so I've been using quite a lot of my potions which have begun to run dry. This probably would have been better to do in Viridian Forest. Well, we picked up a star piece in Mount Moon, so selling that, we can replenish our stock. With that, we can move straight on to the gym. The trainers here are optional, but I do decide to defeat them as all their Pokemon go down to a single Vine Whip, apart from Goldeen I guess. And this gives Apple enough XP to gain another level. So after healing him with a potion and restoring Leech Seed with the Aether we picked up in Mount Moon, we can take on Misty. Misty leads with Staryu and I send out Apple. And we actually match his level this time. Staryu moves first, wasting a turn to use Harden as Apple lets out a Vine Whip, putting Staryu into heal range. This actually works out for us as now Misty won't have a potion for Starmie. Apple poisons Staryu. This time, Staryu goes for a water pulse, which confuses Apple. But Apple pushes through, hitting another Vine Whip. Still not getting the kill. But poison helps us with that. Starmie is out and we don't really want to deal with confusion, so I switch out to Blueberry to live up to his role as Death Fodder. Back into Apple, and as Starmie hits Swift, not doing much, Apple sets up All Reliable. We take another Swift but miss Sleep Powder. Stay in one more turn, and Apple was most definitely in crit range. Sleep Powder hits this time. Apple hits Starmie with a Vine Whip, and even with Leech Seed, Starmie stays alive. I figure another one will take it out, why waste a Vine Whip? But then Starmie gets the turn one wake up, and we were most definitely in crit range. Poison Powder also misses. But that doesn't matter as Leech Seed was indeed enough to pick up the kill, winning us the second badge. 
Our luck was pretty bad this battle, from the confusion to the missed powder moves to even the turn 1 wake up, but we still pull through, letting me at least know that this battle is mostly free for next time. But there's a reason why I wanted to do Misty first, as she wasn't who I was worried about. We have our first official battle with our rival, according to my rules, and he has two Pokemon strong against my starter, and one's already evolved. Remember, my starter is the only one that has any real XP investment, so those two levels we got may make the difference. I grab Coconut the Sanctuary from Route 4, heal up Apple, and let's see how this battle goes. Death sends out his most threatening Lone Shark first, and true to his nature, he's clearly been using a Game Shark, as those levels do not line up. At least make it look legit. Apple sets up his seed, and Pidgeotto goes for a sand attack. A good first turn. I switch out to Almond, and Gus does just under half, with Leech Seed pulling him out of range of a roll. Next into Coconut, who takes a quick attack, revealing that he won't survive another. Then into Chia Seed. Goodbye, Chia Seed. But this lets Almond gain back enough HP to not be in range of another attack. Unless it crits. Goodbye, Almond. Back into Coconut, and is he out of range? Just barely. Leech Seed finally finishes Pidgeotto off. That was his first Pokemon. Next is Rattata, so I switch back into Apple on the quick attack and get off a Leech Seed as it lowers my defense. Apple can outspeed to put Rattata to sleep the next turn, and then it goes down to a single Vine Whip. Guess I should have started with that. But then out comes Charmander. This actually isn't as threatening as Pidgeotto, but after all the damage that's already been done, do we have a chance? Leech Seed manages to hit, and Ember doesn't do much, but the next turn, Sleep Powder misses, and Ember also burns. They're really not even giving me a moment to pretend that I had a chance. Apple's definitely in range of an Ember plus burn damage, but we stay in and hit the Sleep Powder. But at this stage, it's too little too late. Burn does more damage than we can recover. I stole a couple of turns with Poison Powder, and then managed to switch out to Coconut on the turn Charmander wakes up. Goodbye, Coconut. Back into Apple, who immediately gets off a Sleep Powder, and then actually finishes Charmander off with Vine Whip. But there is indeed one Pokemon left. Abra. Abra has no attacking moves. And neither do we. That was my last Vine Whip. We set up a Leech Seed, but it's clear that we're taking more damage than recovering. And eventually, Apple gets sautéed. That was actually really frustrating. We could have won had we not got burned, or gotten the first Leap Powder off. Apple only got hit with two embers during that entire match. But it's probably for the best that this run ended sooner rather than later, as we made loads of mistakes right from the start that would have caught up to us later anyway. We're still pretty early into the game, so a reset now isn't a massive time sink. Moving right on to my fourth attempt, I still have yet to lose to Brock, and I'm still just using Leech Seed. Though Brock isn't as free as I initially thought. If Onyx uses Rock Tomb and it crits, it can pretty much one-shot Apple. However, for whatever reason, Brock seems very adverse to using his gem signature move. The reason why we're on our fourth run links to our first mistake. That being not immediately resetting when Geodude was not our encounter. Because, as I'm sure plenty of you have noticed, Walnut walls all of the Pokemon that Apple was weak to during our last run. And that's not where its usefulness ends. Geodude also gets two stab moves very early on. Rock Throw at level 11, and Magnitude at level 16, which has 30 power points. This thing will be a monster throughout this game. If it survives long enough, that is. This time I also catch some encounters I skipped during my first run, as while they could be useful later, something something bird, something something hand, something something bush, that could be taken in so many ways. Plus, some death fodder is always useful. I grind metapods and cocooners into protein powder for almond before entering the cave. Everything else goes more or less the same as last time, except this time I direct some XP towards walnut. And since Apple was able to evolve into Ivasaur this time, almond's massacre of Paris was in walnut's honor, at least until it learned rock throw. Our battle with Misty goes the exact same as last time, except this time we lose no Pokemon, and Walnut even gets to sneak some of that Starmie XP at the end. Maybe exact was a poor choice of words. But there is a difference that's kind of concerning. Apple's run out of Vine Whips, its only attacking move. And we've used up our one Aether on Leech Seed. This isn't good for our highest leveled Pokemon, but there is something we can do. Remember that TM we picked up in Mount Moon for Bullet Seed? Well, in this game, when you teach a TM to your Pokemon, it gets all of the power points for that move. 
regardless of how much PP it has. This is a very big deal for us, as PP was always the main point of concern during this challenge. And now we have a consistent way to gain PP back. Of course, most common TMs suck, but it's better than having to rely on ethers which are few and far between. But Vine Whip wasn't the main reason why we lost run 1. It was our encounters. So how will we fare with our new arsenal? I decide leading with Apple is still the best course of action as I can get a leech seed off and they'll always do passive damage and Pidgeotto has sand attack. I can then bring in Walnut who completely walled Pidgeotto and starts spamming defense curls as leech seed slowly drains away at Pidgeotto. Then I realize I could have been using possibly the worst move designed in Pokemon. Mudsport. Seriously, while we're stalling, let's talk about how bad Mudsport is. It's a move that reduces damage from electric type moves by half. And guess which type of Pokemon most commonly gets this move? Yup, the one type that's immune to electric. Even Splash has some novelty being a joke move. What's Mudsport's excuse? Pidgeotto is close to being completely drained, so I actually switch out to Armin before that, as Wall has taken a lot of sand attacks, and accuracy is something I really don't want to deal with in a challenge where PP is important. Back into Walnut as Pidgeotto faints, and out comes Charmander. I guess it makes sense? It does have Metal Claw. After a growl, Rock Throw does just under half, and the next turn, Metal Claw does just under half as Rock Throw brings Charmander into red. It looks like we could survive another, but why risk it? I send out Apple on the Metal Claw. A Bullet Seed takes Charmander out. There is literally nothing Abra can do, so I set up a Leech Seed and send Walnut back out to recover its health and gain some XP. And Walnut completely walls Rotata. Look at how much of a difference just one encounter makes. And that's not just this battle. Any battle involving normal and flying types are essentially free now. Speaking of which, Walnut rolls through Nugget Bridge, even managing to level up to level 16, learning Magnitude. No one can crack Walnut now. We get bribed to stop Walnut's rampage, adding to our war funds. The trainers past the bridge are handled mostly by Apple and Walnut with their brand new 30 power point moves, and even Almond manages to sneak in some levels fighting the grass Pokemon. A Pokemon talks to us which freaks me out, so I punt it into the machine, and I had a hostage all this time. So a self-defense. And what's our reward for saving this man? An invitation to a party. Not even a room on the cruise. Just the honor of stepping aboard. But we're broke, so we'll take anything that resembles the high life. And it seems death follows us wherever we go. We use the same exact strat on Pidgeotto as last time, but this time Pidgeotto doesn't go for nearly the same amount of sand attacks as Walnut, so I figure I can stay in. Walnut manages to stay at full health as Charmeleon comes out, and she's at max defense, so we're good. But then Charmeleon hits a smoke screen, and Walnut misses magnitude. Then Charmeleon hits another smoke screen. Walnut misses her second magnitude. And then Charmeleon hits yet another smoke screen. Walnut rolls a magnitude 10, which actually hits, taking Charmeleon down. What were the chances of that? Next is Kadabra, and this thing is actually scary now that it has attacks. The only other Pokemon that we can safely switch into is Apple, who's weak to Psychic, and will probably die to a crit. So what will we do? Sack Cheese is what? Oh, it used Disable. Well, Cheese could have survived, but goodbye, Cheese. Now I can bring Walnut back out without the accuracy drops, and I think she can survive one confusion. Doesn't matter as Kadabra goes for Kinesis, lowering Walnut's accuracy. And then Walnut hits a magnitude 6, leaving Kadabra just barely alive. And then Kadabra throws, missing a disable, and Tackle finishes it off. No. Walnut walls radicates. We've landed three magnitude 6s in a row. And that's the second rival. Resetting three times for Walnut was definitely worth it. What do you want me to do? Um, well we got cut. Let's talk about that instead. HMs are actually really useful in this challenge. These are basically TMs that we can reuse as many times as we want and are pretty common across many Pokemon's learn pools. And as we know, when we teach a move to a Pokemon, it gets all the power points for that move. Unfortunately, once we teach HMs, we're forced to keep it, but let's put a pin in that for now. Before leaving the cruise, we make sure to grab as many items as possible that technically were owed and is most definitely not stealing. This includes an ether, which we need to defeat a sailor for, and our lunch. And some seconds. Time to complete the stupidest puzzle this franchise has ever created. This only took me a total of 10 minutes. All in all, I think I'm on world record pace. 
During this time, I also try to get some XP into Chia Seed, and she manages to evolve into Butterfree. I still let Chia Seed out, but I get a free switch into Walnut on the Shockwave. Voltorb gets off a Sonic Boom, which always does a set amount of damage, and Walnut lands a magnitude 10. That was a bit overkill. And what can I say, I've revealed my entire scheme. Both Pikachu and Raichu have double team which could screw us over, but only because it'll cost us more PP, not because they can actually do anything in return. That Surge. Nearly always a joke as long as you have a ground type, and you can always get a guaranteed one. Speaking of which, we are going to completely ignore Diglett Tunnel as getting trapped by a duck trio is basically a death sentence. It will outspeed all of our Pokemon and they're not high enough level for repels to be effective, which means we're going through Rock Tunnel blind. The part of Lavender Town is full of trainers, but none in particular are difficult. There are quite a few bug catchers and picnickers, so I take this opportunity to get a few levels into Almond, eventually evolving it into Pidgeotto. Apple manages to deal with most of the trainers in Rock Tunnel, and after learning a Razor Leaf, I find a few optional hikers using Bullet Seed for some extra XP. We'll ignore the rival battle for now as we can make it to Celadon, only needing to battle one trainer, and being in Celadon opens up a lot of doors. We can get a free Eevee, we can get Fly, which is not only something that lets us travel to all the towns freely, but is also a free move for Almond to learn. And at the top of the department store, we can purchase drinks, which are insanely cheap for healing items. A fresh water costs less than a potion and heals as much as a super potion. This is a game changer for our health situation, and it's something that Nurse Joy needs to answer for. But that isn't even the best of it. In the department store, we can buy TMs, and what that means is that we can essentially purchase power points now. Unfortunately, they are still quite expensive, but if needed, then they are there for us. Now despite all this, we've got a bit of a situation. Our Apple Walnut Almond Core has given us a pretty healthy balance to dealing with trainers up until now, but there are still two types that we're struggling with. The first being Psychic, as none of these can really take any hits from strong Psychic Pokemon, and Walnut's the only one that can do any meaningful damage. Psychic's a difficult type to deal with, as aside from one line, the only Pokemon in this game that resists Psychic are other Psychic Pokemon, but the other one is a lot worse, mostly because of how unexpected it is. That being Grass. And guess which type the next gym specializes in? Apple has no moves that can damage Grass, and even teaching him a normal move won't quite give us the damage output that we want. Walnut would die to a grain of pollen landing on her. Same to be fair. And that leaves us with Almond. Almond's been good against the odd Picnicker here and there, but none of them really gave out too much XP, so her levels have been lacking compared to the other two. She's also running low on gusts. Now we still could teach a Fly and Aerial Ace as a way to grind, but there really aren't that many safe places where we can get a substantial amount of XP. And even then, we'll only likely get maybe two levels before we start running low on these new moves. And we also need to have enough PP to actually fight Erika. What I'm trying to say is that for the first time, Erika may actually be a gym leader I'll struggle against. And I absolutely refuse to accept this as a reality. But fret not, for I, as with all my runs, have had a scummy plan brewing up in the back of my mind since the beginning that I will absolutely exploit as it breaks none of my rules. However, this in of itself requires a bit of setup, and the setup is playing through the game as normal. Instead of heading towards the gym, we instead make our way to the game corner where maybe blowing our money on slots would inspire some ideas. That was my first try. And this clearly was a sign. According to my driving test, R is a shorthand for right, so we head right and find a grunt down on his luck. Everyone needs a helping hand every now and then, so I attempt to make conversation, but he lashes out at me. It's important to remember that everyone handles depression differently. Speaking of helping hands, if you're enjoying this video even a little bit, how about a like and a subscribe? The more you guys subscribe, the higher this number becomes, and my monkey brain likes looking at large numbers. Well, Walnut makes quick work of him, but it's also important to give people breathing room when they need it. Mr. Grunt phases into the wall and will respect his space. But he inadvertently helped us out, as during this battle, Walnut got enough XP to evolve into Graveler, and that means he can evolve into Golem, with help from my friends. And no wonder that poor Grunt was depressed. Peeking behind the curtain, disguised by the glamour of the game corner, we discover the dark underbelly. An office building. No doubt filled with 9-to-5s, daily stand-ups, bi-weekly innovation meetings, and casual Fridays. Truly disgusting. We need to put an end to this brainwashing as soon as possible. Thankfully we get to avoid most of the grunts, as it's not their fault. 
and we're face to face with the monster that let this happen. In true manager fashion, Giovanni is a joke that can't do anything by himself. Apple and Walnut reminding him that he's only in this position off the backs of others. But this was only the regional branch. The main office is still out there making these poor grunts celebrate Debbie's birthday. Change happens one step at a time. Well, now that the office is empty, I'm sure they won't mind a few supplies going missing. We also found a Max Ether, which we can use on Walnut's Magnitude, which in all honesty I've been spamming up until now. With a brand new camera, what better place to visit than the cemetery? And death has no boundaries, even in death. First up's Vigioso, who we already have a reliable strategy for. Apple does get hit with the gust, but he can get a seed off. Into Walnut and time to stall. And then Charmeleon comes out. Surely death has counters by now. Well, we've got quite a few defense calls set up, and then Charmeleon misses Metal Claw anyway. A magnitude 7 takes it out. Next is Execute, and this is who I would have expected earlier, but it turns out it has no grass moves. Unfortunately, it does have confusion, which is still an issue for us. But we do have a psychic type of our own, so I switch into Banana as Execute misses Elite Seed. Banana misses one Hypnosis. Banana misses another. Banana misses a third Hypnosis. And then Confusion from Execute confuses Banana. And yet this is the turn that Banana finally hits Hypnosis. Lead Seed finishes Banana off. I can bring Almond out and Execute goes down to a couple of flies and a quick attack. Kadabra goes down to a couple of quick attacks as it misses Disable and then a tackle. Almond was most definitely in crit range. Finally it's Gyarados and this thing has no water moves. I switch into Apple on the Thrash and then into Walnut as Gyarados is locked. Rock Throw doesn't get the kill, but we stay in anyway as Bite does nothing. Rock Throw finishes it off. Losing Banana kind of sucks as I really wanted him for the upcoming pass, but with how many coin flips we lost, he kinda deserved it. At least we can use his corpse as a way to gain access into the cemetery, where we'll get our next encounter, Carrot, the Ghastly, who will actually be really important in a bit. We can avoid most of the trainers here, but we do have to fight one optional one that has a Haunter. See that weird rune right there? Yeah, that's a run killer to us. I almost forgot that this completely heals us, and if it does, then we lose our whole team. But like Ghastly, Haunter can't really touch Almond. We make it to the very top, and oh no. Team Rocket even made their grunts to out of work team building exercises. These poor souls are too far in. We put them to ease with Walnut. Mr. Fuji gives us a flute, which we can use to get our next encounter. First I replace our rotting banana with carrot. Move him to the front of the party, buy some grey balls with our newly acquired wealth from saving money on healing items, and head west of Celadon. Here we can wake Snorlax, and while he hits hard, he has no moves that can touch Ghastly. So we can just keep chucking balls until he gets in the first one we throw. I'll take it. Mochi does exceed our current level cap, but we can just keep him in the box until we're ready. Alright, let's just pause here because it seems I've made a bit of an oopsie that I noticed while writing the script. I kinda already caught my encounter for this route, a duo in the grass patch right above us. Now this wouldn't be that big of an issue, but spoilers, we use both of them throughout the run. The thing is, I've already played through the entire game at this point, and I'm not going back. So let's write some fanfic. South of Lavender, there is actually another Snorlax. There is no difference to catching this one as opposed to the one west of Celadon, and throughout the entire run, we never visit the southeast corner of the map, not even to get encounters. So let's just say I caught this one, and killed the other one with Curse or something. Like I said, it can't touch Ghastly. Is this cheating? Yes. Will I still be treating this run as is completely valid and never acknowledge this ever happened for the rest of the video? We can dodge all the trainers on the cycling road by moving very, very slowly. Mug goes down to a couple of magnitudes. And we've made it to Fuchsia. Here's where all of our hard work pays off. We pay for entry to the Safari Zone using the money we mugged from that thug to get some free dental care and the HM for Surf. Come back out and trade our teeth for the HM for Strength. And now what does this mean for us? Well, like I said, we can reach each HMs as much as we'd like to get almost unlimited power points. And with Strength, Surf, and Fly, almost all of our Pokemon can learn a HM, meaning that they have unlimited power points. But wait, didn't I say that you couldn't override HMs? That's true, you can't. But by being in Fuchsia, what we can do is delete them outright. And by doing this, we can just teach them again. And look at that, 
We have all of our strength PP back. We have just cracked this challenge wide open. Because what this means is that we can just fly to a low level route. Spam our HMs on the wild Pokemon for XP. Fly back to Fuchsia. Delete the HM. Reteach the HM. And repeat. With no extra cost to us. And with no risk to our Pokemon. And for Pokemon that can't learn any damaging HMs. We can just switch train. Sure, we risk some damage on the switch, but with how much money we have now, healing items being dirt cheap, and how little damage low level wild Pokemon do to us, this is entirely negligible. And what this means is that by my rule set, since we've proven that we can grind without any risk to our Pokemon in a reasonable amount of time, we can just speed up that process using a brand new method. Levels are no longer a concern to us. Power points are no longer a concern to us. We have broken this challenge using completely legitimate means. Well, technically this only really works with HMs. We still have to be careful about using other moves, and money management is still a concern. So we're not in the clear just yet. I was a bit worried that this would trivialize things a bit too much, but I couldn't really think of a reason not to do this without artificially extending the challenge. Like, what rule would I add? TMs and HMs are banned? The move deleter is banned? Unlike with us not being allowed to grow berries, these rules are far too arbitrary and would just create a different challenge entirely. So I figured, while some might consider this defeating the spirit of the challenge, doing this fits within all the rules I outlined at the very start and is completely valid on that front. Besides, isn't half the fun of doing Nuzlocke's finding weird loopholes to exploit? No, just me? But with that, we can grind all of our Pokemon to level 29, fly back to Celadon, strutting into the gym, and wing attack, wing attack, wing attack, and wing attack. Fourth badge, we almost lost Almond to Acid. Oops. But aside from keeping my hubris in check, we've done it. What challenges does this game have left for us? With our new method for gaining levels, we can now power level Chia Seed until it learns Sleep Powder and get an encounter I've held off on. Based on the encounters we've got up till now, after catching a Bell Sprout on Route 5, we can head up to Route 24 and 25. Both these locations have the exact same encounter table and we're only missing two encounters, Weedle and Abra. So, we can basically force an Abra encounter, or get one the first try. And Chia Seed has the ability Compound Eyes, which increases accuracy by 30%, turning Sleep Powder into a 97.5 accurate move. That is ridiculously busted, and I would have made full use of that if this was any other challenge. We can basically guarantee Abra falling asleep, and catch it using a Grey Ball relatively risk-free from its teleporting away. And unfortunately for Chia Seed, what she just did was help us find her replacement. Bye bye Chia Seed. We can turn Yogurt into an Alakazam in no time, and Alakazam is incredibly useful. Not just for its base stats, but for being able to learn three psychic moves, Confusion, Psybeam, and Psychic. And as we've established, psychic types can act as nukes for most Pokemon, especially in case of the ones we'll be taking on in Sylph. Time to take on the main office. Well, we can actually skip all but two of the Grunter, which is for the best. They're just pawns after all. Even a move like Confusion is able to handle them, but not too soon after, of course we run into debt. In an office building, no doubt. Why fix what ain't broke? And debt actually sends out Execute this time. We can just switch out to Big Almond, who gets paralyzed on the switch. With Paralysis, Execute's actually able to do a bit of damage, but inevitably goes down to a couple of wing attacks. Next is Alakazam, and for whatever reason, this thing only has Future Sight. Why? I stay in to use a couple of quick attacks before switching out to Yoga to take the future sight. Kinda of forgetting that it doesn't have a type in this game. Psychic finishes Alakazam off. Gyarados is out, and for whatever reason, I stay in to use a Psychic, just doing over half, as Gyarados uses Dragon Rage, which always does 40 damage. Another Psychic ends it. Of course, they found a way to sneak Charizard in. Walnut resists fire, but its special defense is really low. She might just end up going down the next turn. And it seems she can survive a non-crit. Which she does, but then gets burned. Rock Throw not getting the kill. Now we might be in trouble. I switch out a carrot and Flamethrower brings it right into red. I think a sack might be necessary. Coconut has been an amazing HM servant for us, and even trained carrot. But I think his time's up. Goodbye Coconut. Oh. No, but really, we need a safe switch. I can send Yogurt back out to outspeed. 
ending the battle with Psychic. All in all, not the worst it could have gone. Could have been deathless if Walnut hadn't gone burned, but that was out of her control. Now with the increased level cap, we can put Coconut to rest and even add Mochi to the team. Back in the office, we get given Lettuce the Lapras for our hard work. If we earned one Lapras, I wonder how many Laprases the big bosses up top are earning. We have nothing to prove, Giovanni's a joke. How did he even get in power? He can't even negotiate a job with the CEO of Sylph after having Overlord of Team Rocket on the CV. This grants Team Rocket some much needed PTO, and now I'm sure they won't mind a few supplies going missing. You know, there's a lot more uh, recreational substances here than the Team Rocket office. Sabrina's gym has a teleportation puzzle, but little does she know, we have a bit of clairvoyance of our own. Kadabra attempts to set up a calm mind and goes down to strength. Mr. Mime attempts to set a barrier and goes down to her critical strength. Venomoth actually survives a strength, but all Sabrina does is waste her heals. Venomoth goes down to the fourth strength. Alakazam goes for a psychic, and we weren't even in crit range. It goes down to strength. Onsukoga. Confusion, psychic, confusion, psychic. We now need a surfer, and I think it's time to retire Carrot. We trade him for Lettuce, who'll also be useful in the upcoming gems. We can serve down to Cinnabar, raid a recreational substance lab, defeat a few burglars as they pay out quite a bit of money, and surf, 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 and surf. Two surfs. Three surfs. Four surfs. Not much to say, we dodged a fire blast from Rapidash, but that honestly wouldn't have done too much. And risked a crit on Arcanine, who also missed fire blast. If Lettuce ran into trouble, we had both Walnut and Mochi that could have stepped up. No. Aren't hideouts supposed to be... hidden? Pretty cool twist back in the day. A shame that Giovanni's still useless. Surf. 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 That was a crit? Surf. And if that was a crit from Nido King, what's Dugtrio gonna do? Surf. When I said Lettuce will be useful in the upcoming gems, I meant she'll be all we need. And if at any point she went down, Water's like the most common type in this game, and single-handedly deals with the last two gems. Why did Giovanni have a Rhyhorn as his ace? In fact, I think I spent more time explaining my HM loophole than I did narrating those last four badges. And thus, we have put hundreds of grunts out of a job and onto the street. Time to become the champion. Are we the baddies? So before moving on to Victory Road, let's settle on the level cap. I usually get the average of all the Elite Four's aces, including the champion, and round that number down. In this game, it will be level 58. And since we have a battle with Dat, why take any chances? With us having such a large level difference between Dat, his Pokemon are a joke. Seriously, why has his Execute still not evolved? You can buy Leaf Stones in this game. Gyarados also has the worst moveset it's had so far. Hydro Pump. Twister. Rain Dance and Leer. It has Leer with a full special moveset, and its base special stat is 60. That's less than Bulbasaur. Charizard's levels are a bit closer to ours, and I do end up risking a crit on Lettuce, but we pull through. And we can move on to the most boring victory road this franchise has ever had to offer. Not a single trainer here is forced, and the layout's so boring. It's a remake, they could have changed it. And we've made it to the Elite Four. Literally nothing changed since our fight with Death, but the Elite Four themselves do in fact require some preparation. Just not as much as I initially thought. We head back to a few dungeons that we avoided when our levels were too low, so that we can pick up some much needed ethers and elixirs, teach a real rock move to Walnut, and break bad to get our hands on a prized thunderbolt. But then we say a very sad farewell to Apple as he's exhausted most of his good moves, and Almond as she's just not very good. And we bring on Kale the Duduo and Kinoa the Eevee, spend some quality time with them raising their levels and use a Thunderstone on Kinoa turning him into a Jolteon. Kinoa then gets to use the TM that was obtained by scavenging through a failed criminal empire, gaining its one and only electric move. After buying some celebratory drinks with the last of our cash, it's time to challenge the Elite Four. First up on our list is Lorelei. Jugon goes down to a Thunderbolt as Kinoa levels up. Cloyster goes down to a Thunderbolt. Slowbro goes down to a Thunderbolt. Lapras manages to survive and uses a body slam that paralyzes, and for whatever reason, Iris the crit from Surf. As Lapras goes for another body slam, it goes down to Thunderbolt. 
Last is Jinx, and she is completely walled by Mochi. Jinx tries to prolong the inevitable, but misses, going down to a single body slam. Jinx goes down to a body slam. And that's Lorelei. Risk no for no reason, but turns out her using Surf was up to chance. On to Bruno, I'm sure he'll put up quite a fight. Bruno, an Elite Four member, starts off with a Pokemon with a lower attacking stat than Pidgey. I use this as a chance to get some levels on the rest of my team, switching out so that when Yogurt comes out, I'm not risking an Earthquake crit. Yogurt outspeeds Onyx, one-shotting with Psybeam. Psybeam one-shots Hitmonchan. Psybeam one-shots Hitmonlee. He has another one? And I use Psychic on Machamp, which one-shots. That's Bruno. On to Agatha, the self-proclaimed Ghost Specialist who uses Poison types. Gengar goes down to Psychic. Golbat goes down to Psybeam. Arbar goes down to Psybeam. Gengar goes down to Psychic. Haunter goes down to Psybeam. On to Lance, the self-proclaimed Dragon Specialist who uses Flying types. I guess he has two pure dragons. Alright, unlike the last three battles, I can't be too smug for this one as it does require some strategy and luck. Well, Gyarados goes down to a single Thunderbolt, but it starts now. Dragonair's Hyper Beam might be able to kill with a crit, but the AI don't base their move choices on that. I try to use a few bites, hoping for a flinch as Dragonair uses Dragon Rage into Safeguard. No flinches for us. But the third bite is able to take it down. The next Dragonair actually does get flinched turn 1, but then paralyzes Kanoa on the next turn. And then Hyper Beam comes out. I was most definitely in crit range. But Kanoa pushes through, finishing Dragonair off with a bite. Also getting my patented pointless crit. But the big boy Dragonite is already out, and this was actually a really bad position to be in, as Dragonite will go for a random move now. We can take advantage of either Outrage, locking it into only that move, or Hyper Beam forcing it to lose a turn. So I make a bold switch into Lettuce, as Dragonite goes for Wing Attack. Now it's not locked into anything, and I don't know if I can survive a crit. I stay in. And Dragonite uses Safeguard. My brother, there is an Ice type on the field. Dragonite goes down to a 4 times effective Ice Beam. And finally it's Aerodactyl, who is completely walled by Walnut, but then gets the Omni Boost from Ancient Power. Not that he can do anything, but makes Walnut waste another Rock Slide. And we have defeated the entire Elite Four without a single loss. Man, don't you miss the days when Pokemon was hard? But we do have a final battle left, and it isn't something that we can win by just spamming one move. Even when I'm about to hit the peak of my career, of course debt is lurking around the corner. Let's earn some health insurance. Dead being as predictable as ever sends out Pidgeot, but we don't have apple seeds this time, but instead Kanoa. Do birds choke on Kanoa the same way they do with rice? Well, Pidgeot chokes on a thunderbolt. With Rhydon out, we can switch into Lettuce on the Earthquake, and I'm honestly not sure if a crit was a roll to kill. And Lettuce can outspeed one-shotting Rhydon with Surf. Executor's finally evolved into Executor. I switch into Kale on the Giga Drain. Kale outspeeds using Drill Pack, not quite getting the kill. And Executor uses Sleep Powder. But of course we were prepared. Dead tries to heal, but we outspeed in two shot, so it doesn't make a difference. Executor goes down to a Drill Pack. Next is Alakazam, and this time he actually has attacking moves. We send out his Natural Predator. It outspeeds using Reflect, and Body Slam does it less than half. Alakazam uses Psychic, and it crits, but Mochi went for the Yawn. We switch into Yoga to take the Psychic as Alakazam falls asleep, and then we get a free switch into Kanoa. Kanoa outspeeds, and Bite doesn't get the kill, but Alakazam stays asleep. Dead heals, but like Executor, we outspeed in two shots, so Alakazam doesn't stand a chance. And this sets us up perfectly as Gyarados comes out, being electrocuted by Thunderbolt. Finally it's the ace Charizard, and can Thunderbolt get the kill? It can't. But it paralyzes. And then Charizard can't move. A final Thunderbolt puts an end to Charizard. And the Nuzlocke. What a fitting way to end the battle. With that, we have become the champion, never once healing our Pokemon at a Pokemon Center, or by any other free means, staying well away from death. But how many souls did we crush beneath our feet to make it here? What actually happened during the second half of the game? It's all a blur. To be completely honest, I played this game in particular because I knew it was going to be an easy one, but I didn't realize quite how easy. Thanks for watching. Hey, and if you uh, enjoyed the video, how about subscribing? I promise, um, you know, yeah.
while this game may have been easy, especially during the latter half, I think it sets a good baseline for future games, as not everything will be as conveniently placed for us in other games, such as the Mood Elita, especially during the DS era. And just picture my rule set, but in a game like X and Y where your friends heal you up every other sentence. Imagine how many Pokemon will lose just to that. Spoilers, I am most definitely going to be trying this challenge in other games, so please look forward to those in the future.